Ruiz. Welcome to another edition of Truth and Rhythm, brought to you by FunkinStuff.net. This is the interview show that gets deep in the pocket with contemporary music's foremost masters of the groove. I am your host, Scott Dr. GX Wolfine, musicologist, creative arts journalist, and multimedia pro. Whether you're watching the video version of this show or the audio-only podcast version, I thank you so much for your continued interest and support in this show. If you enjoy this programming, there are several ways to help support Truth and Rhythm, as well as contribute to further enhancements and expansion, plus get some sweet perks and rewards in the process. First, subscribe to the Funk and Stuff channel on YouTube, which is where Truth and Rhythm lives, and be an advocate by spreading the word among fellow funk, jazz, and R&B music lovers. Second, join Truth and Rhythm's new membership program through Patreon, which features three tiers for truth believers, Truth Seekers, and Truth Crusaders. You can also submit a direct donation to the cause anytime at funkinstuff.net. At that site, which is loaded with awesome content, you can also purchase the book, Everything's on the One, The First Guide of Funk. Shop for official Truth and Rhythm and Funk and Stuff merchandise, and use the Amazon links for all of your online purchases, which allocates a percentage to this show. Sponsorship opportunities are available as well. Contact me directly at scottg at funkinstuff.net. For those of you who go the extra step in supporting the show, you have my heartfelt gratitude for allowing us to continue to shine the light on those special artists whose quest is to find truth in rhythm. I'm delighted to welcome to the Truth in Rhythm Mothership keyboardist, producer, composer, and arranger, Ricky Peterson a member of the famous Peterson family that has been referred to as Minnesota's first family of music. In addition to being an in-demand sessions musician since 1990, he has released several of his own albums that blend jazz, funk, R&B, and pop. His dozens of notable collaborations include Prince, The Jets, Stevie Nicks, David Sanborn, Joe Sample, Paula Abdul, Steve Miller, George Benson, F. Deluxe, Robin Ford, Jermaine Jackson, John Mayer, Shaka Khan, and Rosie Gaines. His recent release... 2021's excellent under the radar is a jazzy soulful and fun family affair none other than ricky p how are you man good brother thank you for having me i, 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 pre, I really enjoy this thanks my pleasure and so i understand you're coming to us from a hotel room in nashville you're on the road tell us a little bit about that we are yeah i'm in nashville we got here yesterday and uh, we're on the road with stevie nicks and uh, a full-blown beautiful band with wadi Wachtel and carlos rios and I could name them all. Uh, there's uh, uh, Marilyn. Uh, uh, I, I, I can I can go through the whole thing, but it's just a great band, and I think you guys would uh, really dig it, man. If you saw it, and, and Stevie sounds great. Well, that's awesome that she's still out there doing it and sounding good. It's unbelievable, man. You know, we're all geezing. I'm geezing. I know that we're getting, we're getting <laughs> to the geezer age, you know. But we're digging it, man. It's a good band. We're all in good shape, so it's fun. That's great. Uh, how long does the tour go? You know what, we started um, at the beginning of uh, September and we're going to go through November 6th and then we'll be done and we'll, uh, we're just, you know, we're actually taking it easy in between shows and stuff, but, uh, but it's a good long two and a half month tour. So it's, uh, it's, it's a great, it's a great time and a great hang with everybody. So if you get a chance to come out and see it, come on and see it. Fantastic. Well, thank you for joining me. I really appreciate it. And uh, fans are really going to dig it. I know it. Uh, all the great people you've worked with. And, you know, I got to start right off, Ricky, with, you know, coming up in that amazing musical household, you know, tell <laughs> us a little bit of what, what that was like. And, you know, everyone being so musical, you know, I'm wondering if, you know, somebody had a tin ear or, you know, were they a black sheep or what is it? It seems like everybody's musical. 
you know what we were we were very blessed very fortunate to grow up with parents that you know played great music they both played wonderful piano my dad was a great arranger Willie Peterson and uh, you know he did a lot of commercials and he worked for WCCO uh, radio which was one of the local radio stations that were around the five state area and my aunt went with my mother who would sing they would do shows because there were live it was live music on radio back in the day and they would have rehearsals at our house every morning so every, I mean we would before we go to school, you know, we'd get up and he'd be tinkling on the piano already, getting ready for rehearsals early in the morning, you know, with these guys. And uh, so we had music running around the house all the time. So everybody kind of by osmosis got got the bu- got the bug, you know. So, but uh, yeah, we were all surrounded by music. So everybody in the family got got the, either the curse or the blessing. We don't know which one it is. It's pretty much a blessing for us, though. I think. And why did you gravitate toward and kind of settle on keyboards? You know what? I really dug the B3, the Hammond organ. And my father played the Hammond organ for the Twins since day one. The Twins, the Minnesota Twins, the baseball team, they're the franchise. And uh, since 1961 until he passed in 69, he was there. And then my mother took over. But they had two Hammonds in the basement, and I always loved the sound of it. And keyboards, you know. I'll never forget when my mother asked me, I would, I would sit down at the piano and play by ear. And I was, I got, had to be, I think it was before grade school even. And it was when the Beatles had help out. What year was that? That was 64, 65, right? 64. And I would play boom, dee, 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 boom, doo, doo, dee, doo. And she went, oh, <laughs> you want to take piano lessons? And of course. And I said, sure. So, she uh, she got me enrolled at the at the local Catholic school with the nuns, teaching me for about eight years of classical music. So I, I just love the keyboards, you know, and, and I just gravitated from there, you know, gravitated to the keyboards and graduated to different genres. So, yeah. And so who were some of your you know musical heroes outside of the Peterson family? Oh, growing up when I was a, you know, a little teenager, a little teenager, I was never little, <laughs> I was a large man, but, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, um, you know, every, I mean, shoot, it started, you know, when we were listening to pop music back in the day, the Beatles, of course, and, and, uh, um, it would, uh, you know, we would graduate to different things like, uh, uh different genres of music, obviously, um, uh, I loved I went into, you know, uh, Emerson, like Palmer. I really loved Keith Emerson and, you know, you know, Rick Wakeman with Yes. And, and, you know, which made me go into a little bit more fusion-y, confusion-y, you know, kind of genre of music with, with Chick Corea and Irby Hancock playing all that great funk on Headhunters and, and uh, you know, and, and George Duke, you know, he, he had that record out called Feel way back in the day, man. It was one of those records that was such an influence on me that uh, I had to, I, I loved it so much. I had my mother, <laughs> talked my mother into buying me one of the first mini Moog synthesizers ever in Minnesota. Well, it was, it was the first one in Minnesota. Uh, the serial number on that one was 2000. So that was, uh, that was a big deal, but I really learned how to do that because I really love that kind of music. And so that's how I, you know, got more into the funky jazz part of the thing. So. Wow. And so what was your first, uh, you know, professional gig, would you say? Well, professional uh, is kind of a, it's, it's, an, it's a big word. <laughs> you know, I was playing music at, at teen dances and stuff when I was 13 years old. So, you know, I was actually making money doing it back then. But uh, as, as far as a, a professional career, I guess I could say it was more when I was in my teen years and 15 16 years old, I played with a band, a couple of different bands. I played with a band called Rocking Horse. It was a great band that did Yes and Emerson, Lincoln Palmer and all the great, you know, rock stars of, of that age, Led Zeppelin and whatever. And, you know, we would do proms and we would do, uh, uh, we would do, uh, you know, the, where they would have big band dances and stuff like that. And then these, you know, we would have elaborate bombs and everything going off and, and things like that. But then it would, then it got into, working with local bands and local bars and stuff like that as we got a little older and playing more pop oriented R and B. And, uh, you know, the, my first professional stuff, I guess would have been when I was around 14 or 15 years old. So, hmm. wow. So, um, what was your first, uh, you know, experience in the studio? 
about that time. My brother had a band called, uh, it was uh, Natural Life, and all the great musicians, the jazz musicians from um, Minneapolis had this band together called Natural Life. It was Mike Elliott, Billy Peterson, my cousin, Bobby Peterson. It had Eric Gravatt was on drums. It had a genre of different drummers that would, you know, a bunch of different drummers actually that played uh, in the band. But they recorded, they were the first ones to record direct to disc at a place called Sound 80 in, in downtown Minneapolis, Minneapolis proper. And uh, it was a great studio. And they were the first ones to have the 3M digital recording out um, on a record. And I got to play on that record. Not the very first one. I guess it was the second one. They, they, they would go on to, you know, go on to different uh, different albums and stuff. But I played the Minimo because I was the only one in town that had a Minimo. So they made they had me come and play. They made me <laughs> come and play synthesizer on it, which it was more eclectic, kind of weird sounds and stuff like that. It wasn't really musical at the time, but they were. And uh, I sure learned a lot from them, man. I have to tell you, Billy, my brother especially, was was very influential in my life as far as teaching me, you know, again, guiding me on my way to different different things, man. So that was kind of my first recording experience, and it was pretty heavy because it was a, I mean, a very state-of-the-art studio run by a guy by the name of Herb Pilhoffer. And uh, it, was, it was really fun for me, and they, of course, it went on and on from there. Um, what, what, what year what year about was that ricky oh i suppose it was 74 75 so it, it was pretty long pretty long ago man and uh and then i would uh and then and when i got into other bands and stuff like that and started singing um uh, gigs with my sister patty we did we were kind of a duet team and we would sing back and forth and we'd sing together and we would sing duets together and, and uh and people would come out to hear us that were in the business and they would go, well, we want those singers to come and sing on our jingle. And so the producers would hire us to come and do jingles in all the jingle houses in Minneapolis. And uh, so that was, a, that was a big thing for us in growing up in 76 on, on to, you know, all through the, you know, until now. So, I mean, we just kind of <laughs> climbed up the ladder, I guess, you know, so to speak. And so in the late seventies, um, you know, as, as Prince was coming up and got signed and got his record out in 78, how aware were you of him? And, uh, you know, how did that sort of, uh, you know, change the local scene? Oh man. Well, I remember distinctly when Prince was in the studio, he was at that studio. I was telling you about sound 80 and he was recording his first record there. And I remember Billy was in the next studio across the room recording blood on the tracks with Dylan. And, and uh, I remember Prince being across the hall, just doing demos in there. And I think it was actually, he was working on the record for you. What 70, was that 78 or 79? Came out in 78. It came out in 78. So it must've been before that. But so it's 76, 77. And I remember meeting, meeting Prince through a mutual friend of ours, Jimmy Bowman whose father was a great friend of my father's and, uh, and he, we kind of grew up together, but he was, we would pal around and he was kind of into that North Minneapolis scene. And he knew Prince and he knew um, Andre and Simone and all these guys that were putting a band together. He says, come on with me. I want you to come and meet these guys. And they were rehearsing at Peppy Willie's house. And I don't know if you remember that name, of course. Yeah. He's Peppy. been on the show actually. Yeah. Great guy. Yeah. Still, still. <laughs> Peppy was very instrumental in having me come and jam with these guys as, as well as uh, Jimmy Bowman was. And that's how I met, I met, uh, you know, Prince and we were in the basement and we would jam and we would have a ball and, and, and Bobby Z was there. And that, that's, which, which is very cool to know that Bobby Z's cousin, Stuart Pastor married my sister. So it's all kind of a close knit little family thing, you know? So, <laughs> anyways, we went on and played and we jammed for years together. And he actually asked me to go on the road with him. I mean, I was the first guy that he asked before, you know, when he was trying to put together the, the revolution, I believe. I don't even know if he had a name for the band at that time. And I was doing my own thing. And I was, and I actually, I've gotten written up about it. Like, what is, he's either really stupid or really smart. And, <laughs> and I actually was doing my own thing and I wanted to go do other stuff. And I, 
and I turned him down. So, um, but we've remained friends. He respected that decision. And when he built Paisley Park and went on with that, we stayed in touch. And he would invite me to come and, and hear him play. Like I, I would drive down to Chicago and I saw him when he was just, it was just starting. Of course, I would go to a rehearsal over at the old Met Stadium where uh, the Metropolitan State, uh, it was uh, the Met, Met Sports Center is what it was when he was rehearsing for his first go out and play the big, big shows for, pay, for uh, um, you know, for the movie. And uh, I'm trying to remember the name of the movie, Dummy. Purple Rain. <laughs> Of course it was, <laughs> but I remember seeing him and they had all the little tricks and stuff on the side of the stage where, where all of a sudden he'd pop up, you know, on, on, on either side of the stage really magically, you know, they had, they had uh, mannequins or whatever they were doing, but I was just like, wow, this is real big time, man. And so he was, he would, he befriended me. And uh, I mean, we were that close, but he was, he always respected my decision for what I was doing for myself, you know, cause he knew, I wanted to go do my own thing and, and, and make my own music and stuff like that. So um, we ended up when he built Paisley Park, he wanted me there. So we can talk about that. I know you got questions about that too. So yeah, yeah, you bet. Thanks, uh, Ricky. So what, what was your the, uh, first impression of Prince as both just a guy and also as a talent? Well, right off the bat, his talent sticks out in my my mind more than anything. Of course, you know he was one of the he was he was definitely touched, man, by by either aliens or God or whatever. It is. And I think God gave him a little tweak and went, "This is this is what you're going to do." And he was so over the top, brilliant, man, with everything he touched. You know, he really was. He was, you know, I I schooled on the piano. I don't know how much he was, but but he could sure play it. You know, he was very, his ears were huge, man. And his guitar playing, I mean, that, his biggest asset was his ears and how he could listen and, and learn stuff. And, and just by, just by listening to Sly and, and you know, James Brown and all that, all the stuff and all the guitar parts of that, and then learning to solo like he did, man, was such a gift, you know, it just, and as a human being, he would, he, he was, he was kind of, standoffish a little bit i have to say you know he wasn't he wasn't he was leery of people he, you know he didn't want to he didn't want to get too close to you know, people so um and but he but he knew who he wanted with him you know what i mean he he picked out even though when paul did it he picked paul out he said that man is talented i want him with me and and that's kind of how he was man he knew he was going who was going to either help him or, or who he could help, you know, I mean, in, in the business. So he was an asset, man. He was a, he was a, he was a, he was a very talented man. And, uh, and we miss him to this day, you know, we talk about him all the time. So, you know, yeah. And, and you were, you were there so early on to see, you know, um, but, you know, talking to Peppy Willie, I mean, he was so developed even that early on with his, right? skill, with his skills. Oh my God. I mean, it's, I mean, if on everything, drums and everything, because that's what he did. It was all him, you know, and that was a big deal to him because he was already doing the music. And that's, you know, that's why he you know, became the symbol. He just said, this is my music. You guys, of course, he got paid, you know, and they paid him for it and they wanted to get paid back. But but he had he had the right concept in his brain. He said, I did all this stuff. You guys should never own it, you know, but. That's another story. So, but <laughs> staying on the positive with him, man, he was, uh, he was a force, man. There's no doubt about it in everybody's life. I mean, musically, we all had the same brain. I mean, we really, we loved the same music and we played the same stuff. So, you know, he just was the one that made it popular and, and really got it uh, happening in the Twin Cities, man, with, you know, all, with, all the, with all the North Side guys, you know, there was, there was a team of guys, man, that were quite, quite infectious. You know, when you mentioned Paul, your brother, uh, you know, getting tabbed to be part of the time. Um, oh, yeah. So is Paul younger than you? Yeah, Paul's younger than me. Yeah. Uh -huh. So uh, what was your reaction when he got that gig? You know, how did you feel about it? Well, you know what? Well, I thought it was wonderful, of course. Yeah, I was like, what? You're going to, you know, you're going to, you know, you first of all took over for, for uh, Jimmy, I think Jimmy Jam or 
yeah, you know, played Jimmy Jam's part in the time. And I'll, I'll never forget the phone call that he got. I wasn't around when it happened, but they called my mom and, he, you know, he, you know, said, here, somebody called you from, you know, this camp and they want to talk to you about something. And that's when they did that. And that's right when they were doing the movie. So he just walked in on that one. And of course it went on from there and escalated. And Prince really, really loved Paul, man. He, I mean, he loved me too, but he, he loved Paul's talent because Paul is really quite a freak, man. <laughs> you know, he plays everything just like Prince does, and Prince knew it, you know. And uh, he knew that he was a force to be reckoned with for sure. So, and you know, one of the big records that came out of that area early, at least for the funk and pop side, was the Lip Sync, and you were involved with that too, right? Well, I was at one point. I would never play with Lip Sync. No, I didn't do that. That one I didn't do. That was more of a Steve Greenberg thing. And Steve had a uh, set of local musicians playing on that, you know, um, local bar band musicians pretty much and, and gave him a shot at it. But it was, it was a Greenberg produ- production with Lip Sync. I never was involved really with that close, but I sure knew him. Uh, we were in the same studio. I was working at the Sound 80 and that's where he did all that stuff, you know. So. All right. The credits I have here said uh, Pucker Up uh, has, has you down on, on that one. Oh, and I had, I did one thing I played on, on the record. Yes, on Pucker Up. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. I, I, you know, I played on so much stuff. That you've <laughs> I thought you were talking about uh, Funky Town in, in that era, but yeah. I, I never was a part. Of it. Now I remember. Yeah, you're right. You're right. You're right. And I'm wrong. <laughs> you know, okay. you forget this stuff, man. It's like, oh, you know, I should never yeah. forget that. Steve will never forgive me. But, uh, but and I do remember that now. Thank you for reminding me, man. And and you, your history of Stevie Nicks, who you're touring with now, goes way back too, right, to the early eighties. Big, actually, no. I, I started with her in, seven, in uh, 2017, and uh, oh, sorry, I'm lying. 2007. Um, CB Nicks, you know, who, my my other going back is more Bonnie Raitt. I knew Bonnie was when she was younger, in, or not younger, but back in the uh, 70s. And her her brother was uh, very close. We were very close, and of course, we played in local bands together. The, the Doug Maynard band, TC Jammers were a great R&B band that she would use when she came to town. But Stevie was new. And I got, uh, I got that through after I played with John Mayer. And uh, I did the Continuum record with John Mayer back in 06 and toured with him for a year. And, and Stevie heard me and she said, I got to have him on keyboard. So I, I went out and I did my little audition for her. And, and, and they and Wadi Wachtel, who's a great musician, friend of mine that I knew from New York City. That's a whole other a topic that's a David Sanborn topic that I, you know, that we can talk about too. But it it just it snowballs, man. It smokes snowballs by word of mouth and all sorts of different stuff. And I played with Fleetwood Mac now for the last four years, and now it's just Stevie again. So yeah, the six degrees of separation is so true, you know. And of course, Stevie had the Prince connection for you know stand up, exactly. and, which is like know. wow. And it, and who knew, you know. And, and Prince would do that with people. He, you know, uh, she's got a great story behind all that. I wish you could talk to her too. But she's uh, she's such a she's such an entity, man. It's amazing, and she's selling out every venue we're doing. We're doing all the outdoor sheds because COVID is still kind of around, and we're still in kind of a bubble. No, you know, we're not. We're trying to stay safe and and uh, you know away from people. So she, so nobody gets sick because once if somebody gets sick, they shut the whole thing down. You know, so. We don't want to do that. You don't want to be the one to bl- be blamed for that one, <laughs> you know. So, but anyways, it's it's marvelous. And six degrees of separation is right, man. I mean, back we play. Well, we play that song every night. By the way, stand oh, back. Cool. Uh, what were some of the um, projects? I mentioned several, like you know, Jets and uh, Paul Abdul and all that. Are there two or three of those that stand out in your mind um, from the eighties that were like really great memories for you before you put out your first solo record? Yes. The jets for one, we did the jets back in 85, 84, 85. And that was, you know, that we did, you got it all over him. And we did uh, a couple, you know, I was, I was supposed to be co-producer on it, but I was more of a a ranger producer on it and uh, played all the keyboards. And that's when I brought Paul in there because Paul was such an entity and in, in the pop era, you know, he was so good at what he did. I said, come on, you're coming with me. Let's go in and do this. And so we did that with David Rifkin. And that was a big deal. And that became huge. And that was a that was a thing that kind of 
snowballed, you know, into some other things. We did, you know, the fine young cannibals. I did with David. I did uh, Colin Hay. I did uh, um, the Go Go's. For God's sakes, I think we did something with that. We did, um, you know, it, a lot of the studio stuff. But I guess uh, I suppose the heaviest stuff would be. Um, I mean, my biggest my my biggest experience with David Sanborn when I started playing with David, that was more of a more of my type of music, you know, where I, I would uh, sit with him and collaborate with him and played on very many records with him and became his musical director in the 90s. And uh, that was, it lasted about 32 years. I still play with him every once in a while now, you know, but uh, that was another huge thing. And he had, you know, gold records back in 92. We did, did a record out that was called Sna uh, 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 Up Front. And it had a great song called Snakes on it. I'll never forget. We collaborated with Marcus Miller and, I've been very, very blessed to play with lots of some of the best musicians on the planet, man. So, um, and just in the Paula Abdul stuff, of course, that was uh, Oliver Lieber who produced that. And that was a huge thing in the eighties, of course. And, and that became, you know, it, it like, it just snowballs, man. And word of mouth and they go, let's get that guy, you know? <laughs> what, what, Ricky, what, what was your, what's generally your process when you go in for sessions like those, you know, how do you, how do you approach it? You know, and do you interject any of your own flavor or you just kind of follow what they want or? Sure. You know what? And, and it happened with Prince too. It's come up with, I would come up with hook lines. I would help them with the rhythm tracks and uh, um, you know, and then because he would have opinion, we were all pretty new at the chant, except especially with the Paul Abdul stuff, but that was, that was relatively new, but he was writing such great tracks. I mean, Oliver Lieber was, and Paul and he would have Paul and I in the studio to help him. And that was, that's a very true story. And we would be there and we would come up with the little lead lines and whatever, you know, that, uh, and, and help with the arrangements. And, and I, you know, it's just, it's, it's a brain picking session is what we would do. We would, you know, he would pick our brains and because he was in charge and, and knew at it. So, and we were, I had some experience, but not that much more, you know, but he's the one that really had hit it off with, with the, with the songs and stuff, man. I was, he was more of the songwriter. I'm, I was more of a instrumentalist, you know, with that playing, you know, writing instrumental songs, you know, I wasn't like a pop singer, you know, lyricist or anything like that, like those guys, you know, he and Paul were more, more in the same vein. So. How, how did you feel hearing some of your songs that you were part of on the radio? Was that a thrill or? Oh, of course, man. It always is. It's like, oh, that's me. <laughs> of course, man. Every once in a while when they pop them out, like in the old classic, it's, you know, it's, it's really fun to hear. And they're still playing, which is really nice. We got, you know, like I, that new record we put out now, and they're even playing a lot of it on the, on the, the jazz sta stations like uh, Watercolors and, and all that. And, you know, the, the, as you know, the business has changed so drastically, you know, there's no publishing anymore. So, you know, you're getting paid by, um, uh, you know, your intellectual property. So, so whatever you play on, they can play it on the radio. You, you get paid a little bit. So it's, it's nice to, to know that we're, we're still in the business doing, making music. We're making history as it goes along, you know. So 1990 was your first solo record, right? Yep. 89, 90. That was Nightwatch. Uh, Nightwatch. Yeah. Which was a really nice, nice funky jazz nice you know, record. And I think it's still beloved, you know, in circles today. And well, uh, I appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah. It was kind of a cult little thing. Cause that was, there wasn't music like that coming out at that time, man, you know, and I have to, I have to blame that on Ben Sidron. <laughs> you know, Ben Sidron is right. Yeah. He, he was a mentor of mine and he was, he was one of those guys that came out and heard us play. And I was telling you about Patty and I and those R and B bands that would play the local clubs. And he was one of the guys that played with my brother Billy, but they were jazzers, you know, they were more jazz than the jazz mean. But when Ben started to hear funky, jazzy stuff, and he went, he knew that's what I did. So he brought me along to play on his stuff to help him um, utilize his talents, which was a, his writing talents, and put it into a more rock R and B vein and he was best friends with Tommy LaPuma and Tommy LaPuma who is one of the most renowned producers in the, on the planet 
he brought him off to hear us and he went, I want Ricky. I want Ricky on Warner Brothers. We're going to get him a deal. And he got me that deal. And that's when I started playing with all the heavies. And he's the one that introduced me to David Sanborn. And I got to play with people like Vinnie Colaiuta and, and John Petitucci and all the, all the baddest cats, man. And, and, you know, talk about a teaching utensil. Holy buckets. <laughs> you know? It's one of those things that just sort of spiraled into some other shit. You know what I mean? So it's really fun. And that, that record also, that first one had uh, Levi uh, Ciceron, who I just had on the show the other day, uh, yep. Paul Robin Ford. Uh, Robin Ford played on every one of my records. Absolutely. Robin Ford and Vinny Colaiuta. Yep. Um, Bland, of course. Michael Bland played on, 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 not the first one, but ones after that. Uh, that first one was mostly just the trio of me, John Patitucci, and, and, uh, and, and Vinny. So what a trio. <laughs> I, re I really like take a chance on that one. Oh, cool, man. Thank you. I appreciate yeah. it. Thank you very much. Yeah. I'm a, you know, big, as you might have guessed, big time funk guy. So, you know, that one definitely has got a groove. I know you're. That's great. Yeah. That's great. I'm glad you dig it, man, because that's what you need. we need all the people we can get that like that kind <laughs> of stuff, man. So, thank you. You're welcome. You came back uh, just a year later with your second one. That was fast, uh, but that one was definitely more like sort of pop oriented. I would say. It's, well, it was a little more. Uh, we did it for a Japanese record label, and it was well. It was it was called uh, Go Jazz, and that was uh, a thing that that Ben Sidron came up with. Yeah, Smile Blue is the one. Yeah, that was a, a Mesa Blue Moon, but it was a it was a jazz label called uh, Go Jazz, right? And that was a Ben Sidron's label out of Japan. So it was a little bit more poppy music. Is that what you're thinking? Yeah, it was more, a little mellower, more vocal. Oriented. It had more vocal stuff on it, yes, but yeah. it had some pretty cool uh, renditions of different songs. I had a, I had a, uh, uh, I uh, did a, a cover of What You Won't Do for Love by Bobby Caldwell on there. And that became pretty notorious in, in the business. People loved that version of it. Even he called me and said, what the hell did you do to my song? <laughs> <laughs> so he loved it very much. I mean, he, and we became very fast friends and, uh, and I wish him well. I hope he's doing great. So. Uh, and then it was a while before the next record, the third one was Souvenir. Is that right? No, I came up with one that was called a tear can tell. And that was on the same label as, uh, as go jazz. I mean, as the, as the one before, uh, it was a go jazz label. And that was another one that had, uh, it was a little bit more of the pop, you know, it was more eclectic, a little bit, had a couple more jazz tunes on it. And uh, it had uh, lots of vocals. And, and then Souvenir came up. That was in 1999 or something like that, I think. That was a few years later. Oh, yeah, a tear can tell. Yeah, yep. I, skipped, I skipped a page here. Oh, that's um, right. Yeah, no, that one... Uh, I really liked um, EJ. EJ. <laughs> I don't know why I called it EJ. Don't ask me. I could, because it's some, we had a little, little uh, Eastern Europe vibe on it. And, and uh, I think I called it, at, at first I just called it Egypt. He says, you don't want to call it Egypt. You got to call it something else. You call it, how about EJ? Okay. <laughs> so silly shit. You know, I'm sorry. I don't know if we're cut. We can't cuss on your on your show no you can feel free oh, okay yeah. Good. uh but also it, also, also i'm sorry they, most of that stuff up in the studio so you know mr williams nice this, uh thank you man that was a that was a labor of love that i wrote for uh a dear friend of my mother's who was a who was a wonderful musician who did a classic show out of the, a place called the old log theater in minneapolis and he would host a show for the kids. And it was a kid's show for, uh, consisting of, of Red, Red Riding Hood uh, and different little, little you know, kid plays. And, uh, and he would always come out and do a, a whole thing and have the kids sing along and stuff like that. But he always write these little jingles, or these little lines that were so beautiful, I thought. And so I, 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 I I took one from him, and that was one of the things that went. That just was so cute that he would sing to the kids, and the kids loved it. And 
and I, I I wrote it into one of my my songs, and he he thought that was pretty cool. So that's why I gave him the the kudos on it. You know, yeah, was, nice nice tribute. Yeah, and then uh, uh, Jay Darling. That's, how. that's my. It's called Jarling. Jarling. <laughs> Jarling, I called her Jarling. That was my wife, Luann. I wrote that for her. And uh, it was those, everybody said, Jay Darling, that's pretty cool. And it's, yeah, it's Jarling. It's because, you know, it's our little baby dog that we do. So <laughs> that was that. that's what that was about. I know it's sappy, but that's what it is, man. Feel so bad is also hot. Um, Great one, the, man. But, yeah. EJ, EJ um, I felt like. Um, you know, a little bit of influence, maybe of a kind of that sound of like sexy MF, you know, that kind of Prince and new power yeah, generation kind of groove. Yeah, maybe the drum beat a little, maybe. Sure. And that was before that, <laughs> before sexy MF, I think, wasn't it? Uh, I, I got n- 95 for that. I, sexy MF was 92 uh, or 93. Yeah. Was it 93? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe. I, I don't know if I was thinking about that, but you know, those grooves are, you know, they're universal. So. And we James all love the same groups, you know. <laughs> so. Yeah, back to James Brown for sure. Um, oh, no doubt. I felt like uh, Ricky on that album that you you struck a, a a better balance. Like the first one was like real jazz, more jazz, and the second one was a little more with vocals. And then on this one, the third one, I felt like you brought them together nicely and had Thanks. a mix of it all. Yeah, yeah, it was it, on on. Are you talking about a tear can tell? Or yeah. You- yeah. yeah, that was exactly what happened. That's exactly right. We found kind of a little niche in that in that area, and uh, excuse me. So it was uh, it, it came together nicely, man. I mean, we we already had experience doing that. So and and you know we were we loved music, and there's there's a few covers on there, but those are songs that we loved. Everybody, you know, who doesn't like a, the Secret of Love by James Taylor or a Secret of Life, you know? And it's like I had to do it. Ben said absolutely you're doing that song and so i came up with my rendition of it and i, I really love that one and and what the other one uh the simply simply red tune man you know holding back the years yeah. what a great tune you know i never thought i would do that but we used it and and billy i'm going to give billy kudos on that my brother billy who played bass and, and uh and uh who's a wonderful musician i was telling you about him before but he came up with this this John Coltrane vibe on it, but it was a boop, boop, real kind of real kind of ethereal eclectic thing, man. But it was cool. And I put the groove behind it and we just one of those things. You would never know it was holding back the ears, you know. <laughs> but uh I can't remember the name of the dang song. What was it? it was it holding back the ears, wasn't it? Yeah, or, that's right. You're right. Yeah, pretty sure. Yeah, yeah um, simply simply red tune. Yeah, it's great tune. How how'd you feel about the um, the results and also the reception of these solo records you were putting out? You know, what were your expectations and ambitions with them? Well, hopefully, we we're going to go do. You know, I was I was, you know, I was never you know intrigued about being a big star or anything like that. It was just it was putting out what we call Ben and I coined the phrase "You're making history." You you know you're putting music out that you love. Let history decide. You know what? What's good and bad? They can we'll do whatever we want. We're just going to do what we want and put music out that we love. And for me, I was very, very, very blessed to be able to go out and do things like in Japan behind these these gigs and uh, these records. And it was really receptive. You know the that they, they loved these records overseas more than anything, you know, because I, you know, everybody in, in, uh, in the United States, they didn't quite get it to the point where it would be, you know, very, that much more popular here, but overseas, it was great, you know, in, in, uh, in Asia and in, in, in Europe and what have you, they received it a lot better. So, but that way, and that was fine with me because I got to go play those places, you know, how, how lucky am I, you know, be able to go, all over the world to play my music. I did a, a, a thing behind that that first record in Japan with a guy by the name of Sadao Watanabe, who was a huge saxophone star. And he called me up and said, he loved that record. And he said, do me, I want you to do me a favor and put a band together for me. I want you to come and do my club and we're going to play for a week. And that was one of the best experiences of my life because of that 
And I'm going to, again, blame it on Ben Sidron and Nobu Yashinati, who was uh, the head of that record label. Uh, <laughs> and they had me, let me put this band together, which was the All-Stars. Of course, I had Will Lee on bass. I had Gino, uh, 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 Vinny Kaliuta on, on drums, of course. Uh, Carlos Rios on guitar. Did I say Willie? Yes. And uh, Lenny Kester on percussion and me on keyboards and Sadao on, on saxophone. It was marvelous it's on YouTube, by the way, if you want to check it out. Wow. <laughs> so just wonderful things like that happened to me. And that, you know, that that just kind of it, it flourished for me, man. And, and I got to play with my biggest, the biggest thing is I love producing records. I mean, I love being in the studio working with these people and making them sound as the best I can do for them, you know. So mm -hmm. like like working with George Benson, what a thrill. Yeah, hello. <laughs> you know. And he loved it. And I've and I've always brought Paul. I got Paul and Billy on my on my back. You know, I gotta bring them in there and haul them in. They gotta play with me. So they're there. And hold my hand. You know what I mean? Very fun. Around that same time those solo records were coming out, you were also pretty ensconced, ensconced in the Prince Paisley Parks goings-ons and um, a lot of projects you worked on there, at least what I have here are things like, uh, you know, you can be heard on the Come, um, Gold, um, I think Crystal Ball, uh, Most Beautiful Girl in the World. Some of those that was, uh, he gave me that, that was a bone that he gave me, man. He, he uh, that was one of the first things that, somebody else ever produced for Prince and uh, or co produce I should say. And he, I'll never forget. He would, he would go when I was there doing stuff, he would, you know, he was bringing a lot of people in like Mavis Staples. He was bringing people in like, uh, uh, Oh, Nona Gay, Marvin Gaye's kid and uh, Shaka Khan. And he would give me projects to work on for that stuff. He would write the songs and then I would finish them. So if you look a little deeper in all that stuff, that you'll hear me on all that stuff. That's me doing the arrangements of them, playing keyboards on most of it. And, and uh, that's when he dropped Most Beautiful Girl on me. He said, here, fix this. And it was a little, I'll never forget, it was a cassette tape of him playing guitar. on it, And this dark ass keyboard part that you could not decipher. It was just like real low stuff garbled stuff and but he had a vocal on it and of course i went okay well, let me let me mess with that so i took it and put those changes to it and uh and then had a couple other guys come in and play on it which <laughs> was pretty funny because Fritz said i hate other guitar players but this is really good and i had a guy by the name of jimmy berenger playing on it and a really great guitar player from minneapolis and of course michael bland playing drums and uh, me on keyboards and played a little organ on it, played the changes and then and, and brought it back to him. And he just went, what? And he really, really, and that's when we really connected. So, and then he went, okay, well, you're doing this. And then I think gold was his favorite thing that I did for him. I helped him with on that one. And that was, I'm talking about labor and love, man. We've had, we had such a great time. And I have to, I have to talk about, uh, Tom Tucker, who is very, very much uh, a part of that, who was the engineer that made all that stuff sound as great as it did. So he was there, and he and I were thick as thieves. So he was my best friend at that time, and uh, and he had passed in two thousand uh, mid two thousands. But uh, uh, a huge loss for all of us because he was such an entity in the studio, you know. But anyways, that's how it works. And uh, that was uh, Prince and I had our mutual respect for each other, man. And we'd laugh a lot, you know, <laughs> you got, I got to tell you a little quick story. If you want to hear this, this is a great little fun, it's funny story. Absolutely. That's when that's we're, why we're here. Uh, yeah. When we were doing a most beautiful girl, we were mixing it. And uh, I think I was adding some parts and, and uh, we had, of course, all the state of the art, you know, throw, cost to the wind you know it was we had everything that we could ever think of i had all my my gear there and everything but tom tucker and i there's a very flamboyant part in that song where he goes and the stars are you know come out or something like that in the in one of the lyrics and and we would tom and i of course were, were laughing and and we just we thought it was funny and of course we would repeat it and listen to it again over and over 
and we're howling. And you know, of course, me, I'd, I'd, I'd do, I'd be, you know, just a goofball. And here's Prince in the window in the, in the side of the studio, watching us like this, <laughs> knowing exactly what we were doing. And 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 he just he looked at us and went. And walked out. He's got this, fit, but he's, he was cracking up, of course. He, we thought it was funny as hell. So, but he would just, just put it in the window. And, he, and we had no idea how long he was there. You know, he was probably sitting there for five, 10 minutes just going, you, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but it was a good, that's a good little end of that. <laughs> that's like and Prince. Had, I was all, I'll probably always watch him one way or another, right? Oh, sure. You know. But he, we enjoyed each other's company and, and always had mutual respect. One of the nicest things he ever said to me, uh, walking down the hall, he said, you know, and I think it was when we were doing gold. He said, yeah, I like Babyface, but he ain't got no Ricky P. <laughs> you know, and that, that melted my heart. You know, and I, then I knew he, he actually, he actually loved me. So, you know, and, and, and vice versa. You were, you were like one of his secret weapons, you know? Sounds like I think I think it was something like that, man. A little yeah. bit, yeah. Yep. Um, did you have any idea, Ricky, that uh, most beautiful girl in the world would serve sort of like as his middle finger to Warner Brothers? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I didn't have any idea. The only idea I had is I knew it was on a different label, and that was that was already a feat in itself, man. I was like, how the hell would you do this? You know, and that's exactly what it was. And he was just going, you know what, I can do this. But then, then he got. We all got kind of, you know, bamboozled by that one because they went off. I think it was Bellmark it was the name of the record company. I'm not sure, but pretty sure. Yeah. <laughs> As you wouldn't forget that, you know, and they ran off with the dope. So he ended up, I think, redoing the track or having Mo, you know, Morris um, redo that track for the gold record. But you still utilize all my stuff in there. And uh, so the original still exists, as you know, and they still play it a lot. So. Uh, but it's, it was one of those, had no idea it was going to be such a huge hit, man. but Tom Tucker in the, in the background, when we were mixing it, cause we always mix stuff together that, that I worked on said, and, and the assistant engineer said, Brian Pope, I think you're Brian Poor, I think Poor was the assistant engineer. And they said, it's going to be a smash. And I went, really? Okay, cool. I, I, I would. Well, of course, I would love that. It has my dang name on it, you know. And uh, and it became his biggest number one selling record, our last number one. So yeah, I was going to say, um, actually, he had that record, I believe, for the record record for twelve straight years of a top ten pop hit, and that was the la that ended the string. That was the last one. Yep. In that string, yep. yeah. That was, that was the last number one hit he had, even though he had a bunch of hits. I mean. I Hate You was another one that came out very soon, uh, soon after that, and I did that one. Um, that was a real, that was a really fun one, man, because I had I, I put some I put some jazz shit in there. <laughs> uh, love <laughs> you know, that record. That's such a fantastic record that yeah. goes in so many interesting places. Exactly, and that was my whole point of doing that that tune, and he loved it, man. So that was a, that was a cool thing. So we, you know, after that, he he trusted me, so that was pretty cool. Did, did you get a, what kind of sense did you get being around there um, that there was this, you know, the feud he was going through and because uh, it was really in that turbulent period for, for him in terms of the labels and things. Well, I'll tell you what, he never really talked about it because he, he left, he left it to himself to deal with it. He really did. He didn't really involve very many people because it was his thing. And, uh, I don't know how somber we were because we were still making history. We were still making music and that's all he, that mattered to him because he had finally, he had, you know, Paisley records, which was of course a subsidiary of, of Warner brothers, but it was his. So he was okay with that. So he must've gotten some kind of, you know, some kind of uh, re what's the word I'm looking for. He got, he got his, he got his due. <laughs> whatever was due to him, he got. So, uh, and, and that's why we were making all those great records. Of course, they weren't, I don't think they were receptive enough to put things out. I mean, gold, 
barely came out, you know, and that was a huge record. That should have been huge, huge. It should have been another Purple Rain, oh, in my view. Yeah. But it's number one hit, man. Absolutely bar none, you know. But they, they didn't do it because they were best at it, you know. I'm yeah. sure blame it on them. But, um, but he did it. He was making history, and boy, did he ever. That, that one. That that one is something else, man. And it's a lot of people's favorite. You know, gold was a big deal, man. Even though they had the little snippets of stuff in between songs on it, I thought it was a little yeah. over the top. Yeah. <laughs> what? I, I wouldn't have done that, but that was kind of what he liked. So what, what was the uh atmosphere vibe like around Paisley Park itself, you know, when you were in and around there at that time? I'll tell you what, I, Tom and I were I was in damn near every room, man. Because I was doing stuff for me, I was doing stuff for, with with uh, David Z in another studio, and uh, we were doing stuff with Prince. So I was I owned the joint. I really did for I don't know nine years. Excuse me. I was there, you know, running around. We make jokes and have fun. We had carte blanche. We had spaces in the basement for park our cars, and you know, we we owned the joint. So we were we were had our offices. I had an office upstairs. I had my I had my ADAT studio up in there when that was popular. And uh and we did a lot of records in there. I mean we you know did our sequencing up there and they would bring it down, you know, with my big old fat rack of you know refrigerator rack and shit and bring it in the studios and you could just roll everything around. The B3 I could roll around. It was my B3 so you know I could roll that around and then and uh, so we brought a lot to the party to Paisley Park, and he was he was very receptive to that. So and, uh, and so he let us do what we were doing because we were bringing stuff in. It was busy all the time. I mean, the sound stage for doing movies. We did, you know, we did uh, graffiti bridge, grumpy old, grumpy old men. We did all sorts of uh, everything. I mean, there was all the stuff that was being done in the big theaters. You know, was, a lot of it was done there because it was probably a little cheaper than. Hollywood, but uh, you know, it's just it was it was always going on. There was so much stuff going on, man, all the time. And it was wonderful, wonderful. Everybody was elated, man. Everybody was working. Everybody was happy. And you know, of course, he was going through a little turmoil with the with the Bellmark and, and Warner Brothers thing. He never. The only thing that was funny about it was that his name changed. He didn't want anybody to call him Prince, you know, because that's not my name, man. It's not my name, Mister. <laughs> so he was either a hey man or boss or, or dude or whatever, you know, I called him a hey man. Usually, usually, <laughs> Hey man, how you doing? <laughs> you know, we pass each other in the hallway, whatever. He'd come in and say, how you doing, man? You know, it's, but it was, it was, it was a little strange, I have to say, but, uh, but it was a wonderful time to be there, man. Cause everybody was doing something and it was all coming out. I had, I had George Benson there. We had, I mean, they everybody loved the studio because it was such a state of the art. Plus, it was Prince, so they they could get a uh, glimpse of Prince. You know, that's a big deal in itself. You know, so there's much more to this great Truth and Rhythm interview. Just continue on to the next part of the episode. Also, be sure to subscribe to this channel if you've already done so. Please share it with friends and become a member by joining Truth and Rhythm on Patreon or consider donating at funkinslift.net. Thank you very much.